Welcome to the Broken Vessels Podcast. Jeremiah 18.4 states, And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to do. This is the Broken Vessels Podcast. I'm your host, Joshua Simpkins. This is a podcast where we have discussions on theological themes for the broken to bring encouragement and hope in Christ. And I would like to welcome you all back to another episode of the Broken Vessels podcast. So very thankful that you're here to join me again today. And we're going to be talking today about brokenness and the good gift of weakness. And you may be thinking to yourself, how in the world can weakness be a good gift? Well, we are going to talk about that today because I have a returning guest, the author and podcaster, Eric Shoemaker. As I said, he's an author, podcaster, songwriter, and has served in pastoral ministry for over two decades. He is currently the pastoral ministry director for the Baptist Convention of Iowa, along with Elise Fitzpatrick. He is the co-author of Worthy and Jesus and Gender, and the sole author of Ours and My Last Name. Eric and his wife, Jenny, live in Iowa with their five children. And it's just a blessing to have Eric back on the program and talking about the good gift of weakness because he actually wrote a book by that name. So Eric, welcome back to the Broken Vessels podcast. It's so wonderful to have you back on. Thanks, Josh. It's great to be back with you. All right. So we want to get into this topic of talking about weakness being a gift. But before we get into that, I'd just like to ask your own experience that caused you to even want to write on this topic. There's a lot of ways you could go there. I think one of my experiences is just my own sin, my own pride with wanting to be strong, wanting to be seen and celebrated Mm. as strong and feeling a sense of shame in the areas where I'm weak or feel like I didn't measure up to other people's expectations and sometimes idols of strength. And that's really a gospel journey of God teaching me and he still is, to rest in the sufficiency of his strength, which is made perfect in my weakness, Yeah, and to be satisfied in being dependent on him, yeah. on being a person who needs and finding everything I need in who he is for me in Christ. I think it's especially hard for us as men, but I think for women too, especially because culturally, you know, the whole gender construct. I mean, you wrote the book, Jesus and Gender, but there's all these preconceived ideas of how men and women are supposed to be and act and this and that. And obviously for us as men, it's like, you know, on the one end, you hear the people railing about toxic masculinity, and then you got the Mm -hmm. other people over there talking about how, look at all these, you know, wusses out here that aren't being men. And that's the problem with society, you know, and it's almost like there's no room for anything. You know, it's either or black or white, whatever you want to call it. So, you know, and there's a big push and I don't even think this is a new thing. I think this is definitely American evangelicalism predominantly throughout the years and the decades. But this idea of never showing weakness, because if you show weakness, that means that there's some kind of sin in your life or whatever, you know, Mm -hmm. or if you show any kind of weakness or like men don't cry. Mm -hmm. men don't shed tears that's a sign of weakness or men don't say i'm sorry or whatever it might be you know and man that's not just in the culture and being pushed in the culture especially like right now (laughs) with the christian nationalism stuff going on and uh you know like we're men and we're gonna fight for everything you know and but it's in the church And Mm -hmm. man, I know like for me personally, that idea, like where I grew up showing any kind of weakness, if you showed any kind of weakness, then people were going to start looking at you sideways. You're not really a very good Christian. You're not as spiritual as I am because I don't have anything weak in my life, you know? So I guess the question then, how does that line up with scripture? Because it seems to Mm. me like we're supposed to be, well, we're going to get into that, but I think of Paul when he says, you know, in second Corinthians, his strength is made perfect in my weakness. And so what do you have to say about that as far as the influence of the culture into the church? 
Well, I think you're exactly right on so many things there, Josh. You know, we have culture that is on the one hand complaining about this idea of toxic masculinity, and then you have the other side that's this idolatry of the alpha male, almost a Tim the Toolman, Taylor grunting, you yeah. know, we're, we're men. And I'm wearing flannel and I have a beard, you know, I'm comfortable with masculinity, I guess, whatever that means. Yeah. But there is this whole thing of like, can men be sensitive? Can men be strong? And then it's not just with men. You know, you get into with women, the whole I am woman, hear me roar. For women to be liberated means that they have to be strong. Right. And I don't know that that's the aim of femininity or masculinity. The aim is for both men and women. And these are the things that Elise and I have been talking about in our books. The aim for both men and women is to be conformed into the same image, that of Jesus Christ. And to be conformed into Christ's image means to allow his power to be perfected in our weakness. And it doesn't mean boasting of how strong we are and how awesome we are. That's antithetical to the gospel. And we'll get into this, you know, embracing our weakness doesn't mean groveling and constant self deprecation, you know, we don't see that in Paul. It means humility and accurate assessment of ourselves and who Christ is for us. Yeah. Well, you say in the first chapter of your book, you actually explain how we were designed to be weak. And that's interesting to me because a lot of people would say, that doesn't sound biblical to me. Like God didn't yeah. design weakness. Like we were designed perfect in the beginning. But I have a little bit of a vibe of where you're going with that. I want to hear about this. I want you to flesh yeah. that out. You know, why would God yeah. create us this way? Yeah. So that sort of knee-jerk response that we have that, oh, no, we weren't weak in the beginning. And just to blow your mind, too, I'll say that we're weak in the new creation, too, in our resurrection bodies, which Paul calls imperishable and undefilable. We're raised in power. But, and we can talk about that, but that knee-jerk reaction comes from believing that weakness is wrong, that right. weakness is inherently sinful, and therefore before the fall, before sin enters the world, we couldn't possibly be weak. But power or strength is essentially, it's the ability to produce an effect, to make something happen. And so to be weak is to have the inability to make something happen or to be to be without the power to do it. You need power or strength from outside you to be able to do these things. Right. And so as we look at creation, the first thing we see is that we depend upon God to exist. He made us. And the scripture says that he sustains us, which means that we lack the ability. One weakness we have is we can't keep ourselves in existence, which means we're entirely dependent upon God. And it's more than that. You know, we see in the beginning, he gives us our existence. Scripture says that he gives us our purpose. We are not self-determining. We don't get to decide, here's what we exist for. God says, let them rule. We don't have that purpose apart from God giving it to us. God creates the earth and he creates the garden that man was made to dwell in and the earth he was made to dwell on. We're dependent upon God for our place. Mm -hmm. uh, he creates all the trees in the garden and says, let them be to you for food. You know, eat of any tree you want except for this one. We're dependent upon him for our provision. He's the one that gives it to us. We're dependent upon God for protection. We're not able to understand that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil will kill us if we eat from it, that we'll die. But God gives that warning because we lack that knowledge. We can't figure that out on our own. And so we can go on and on that way. And essentially it is to say that God made us to depend on him. Right. And that is a form of weakness. And it's a weakness that's good because it's the backdrop against which God shows off his strength and his goodness and his glory and all those things. And so that's what I call, you know, we I differentiate in the book over three different types of weakness. And that's the weakness that I call natural weakness, yeah. that we're created to be that way. And to add to that is God said, you know, and another weakness is God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helper for him. The fact that you need a helper implies you're incapable of doing the job by yourself. Mm -hmm. which is a form of weakness. So every aspect of how we're created before the fall is 
highlighting and emphasizing we depend upon God entirely. We are weak creatures. And so, and God said, God saw everything he made and it was good. Therefore, it's good for us to be weak in the ways that God made us to be weak. So you talk about these three views of weakness or three types of weakness. You already shared the natural type. Go ahead and share all three of those again. And how does that play a part in God's plan for redemption, which I think is kind of the thrust of what you're trying to get to in your book? Yeah. So I just explained natural weakness, the weakness that is present in creation simply by the virtue of us not being the creator. Being the created makes us inherently weak right. as we relate to God. The second is what I call consequential weakness. And I mean that it's a consequence of the fall. Right. And so we have moral weakness. We are now sinful by nature. And I think we can make the theological argument we're incapable of doing good left to ourselves. Yes. Uh, we're incapable of saving ourselves. The leopard can't change his spots, mm -hmm. you know, and the evil heart can't start doing good. And so that's the bad form of weakness is that I, by my very nature, am a rebel against God. And then what unfolds from those consequences, from my moral weakness, other consequential weaknesses are our relationships are weak because we begin to destroy each other through our sin. Our bodies are weak in a new way. Not only do we need sustenance, we've always needed sustenance and that's good, but now our bodies are weak in the sense that they are decaying and they will return to dust. That's yeah. the ultimate form of weakness is to be dead and then to be under God's wrath, you know, just compounds those matters. And so that's consequential weakness. And then I talk about relative weakness, which I mean is our weakness in relationship to other people or things. And so even within our natural weaknesses and our consequential weakness, we live in a world where some people have bodies that are relatively stronger than other people's minds, intellect societal positions, wealth, those sorts of things where relative to our neighbor, we are strong and they are weak or we're weak and they are strong. And that could be a result of the fall. Some of that's just the result of life in this world. But our sinful weaknesses, our moral weakness will exploit those things. Yeah. But they also offer opportunities for us to display God's strength in the way that we respond to our relative strength or weakness to our neighbor. So I'm kind of thinking through this weakness in and of itself. So just having to be dependent on another is basically a form of weakness. That's not a bad form of weakness. In fact, that's a very oh, good form yeah. of weakness. Yes. And then the moral weakness that comes with, like you said, the fall. And then, you know, this other weakness that we have with our relationships and all of that. I was thinking too, as you were talking about, like, you know, we were earlier talking about, you know, this idea of strength that is put out there by the culture and then also within the church, this idea of strength. And you even shared like your own personal experience. You look at your pride as being weakness, whereas in a lot of Christian context, not showing weakness, quote unquote, in other words, not showing that you have to depend on others and being the person for everyone else to depend on that's looked at as a strength, but man, I can see any time that I've ever wanted to think that way, it always blew up in my face and it proved to me that's a weakness. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. so, and that's a, yes. that's like a moral weakness. <laughs> so, yes. cause it's a result of that sin. So I think it's really good for us to understand that coming to the place where we understand that Christ came in our place to experience all of the weaknesses that we experience is, well, it says he came in the form of the weakness of flesh, right? Like he, yeah. he came in the form of, of man and mm -hmm. humbled himself to come and to experience what we experience, but to do it perfectly in our place as our substitute. Mm -hmm. And then to mm -hmm. take all of that to the cross. I mean, man, what a great story <laughs> God yeah. has going on because it just, it's something else. So I guess when we look at weakness, obviously on the moral end of things, that's really where we really think about the brokenness that comes from our weakness, you know, or yeah. the weakness of the world because of 
the creation being cursed as well as ourselves. We can go on and on and on about the brokenness that we all face, and we talk about that over and over again on this podcast. But I think what I want to ask you is, what is the kind of brokenness that we face as a result of misunderstanding what God really, how God designed us to be weak? But not only that, but misunderstanding really what weakness is in scripture and within this whole plan of redemption. You know, what is the brokenness that we face because of the fact that we misunderstand weakness? Mm. Yeah, the brokenness we face is we go on being broke and compound our brokenness. Yeah. Because in our inability or unwillingness to embrace our weakness, the necessary consequences we're unable or unwilling to ask for help. The cry for help, to receive help, requires you to say, I'm weak here. Yeah. I need something. And if I'm not willing to admit that, then the only option is for me to fix myself. And, you know, a broken pot can't put itself back together. And it needs a potter. Well, and you don't, you don't find justification. You don't find justification in thinking you can fix yourself. I was thinking as you were talking about that, the Pharisee and the publican. I mean, what did the publican do? He got down on his hands and knees and beat his breast and said, oh, God, have mercy on me, a sinner, while the Pharisee's standing off to the side with his hands raised toward heaven, telling God all the wonderful things he's done. And yeah. and Jesus said it was the publican that went home justified to his house that day. And yeah. we cannot have redemption if we don't accept the fact that we are weak. <laughs> yep. Amen. You know, in Isaiah 53, it actually says that he, one translation says he carried our weaknesses. He bore our weaknesses. That's the word that's used behind our sicknesses. He actually became weak. And if I'm not going to trust Christ by faith to carry my weakness, then the only one left to carry it is me. And like you said, the gospel is just such a beautiful and really unlikely story. Because you think up any movie, when you think in your mind of a hero who's coming to rescue weak enslaved people, you think of this person who is an Avenger, who is rippling with muscles or superpowers. Yeah, and Ram- Rambo's going to come in and save you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you see this strength appearing on the scene. And when the king appears on the scene, you know, Isaiah is saying he was like a root out of dry ground. And a root that's coming out of dry ground is weak. Yeah. No one bets on it to brittle. grow. It's brittle. It's shriveled. And he says he didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him. No appearance that we should desire him. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. Jesus was, you know, I remember I remember a celebrity pastor that I won't name years ago talking about Jesus. You know, he was the son of a carpenter and he did work and he had muscles hanging from his frame, you know, and he was a ripped dude. <laughs> and and I'm thinking, well, Isaiah says he's someone that we look at and we don't value. Yeah. He's a throwaway. He's a nobody. He's a loser. Even if he was physically fit from walking around everywhere and doing manual labor, he didn't have an impressive form in the way that the world is looking for in a king. Yeah, he just looked and, like an average everyday guy. Yeah. And there's so much we don't know about him. But even putting that aside, Paul says that in the end, the ministry of this king is to be a Messiah who is cursed, hanging on a cross naked as people make fun of him and spit on him. And he dies in a way that the law says means you're cursed, hanging on wood. Mm. And Paul says that that is the weakness and the foolishness of God. It is weakness to both the Jew and the Gentile to think of this is your saving king. I think of the yeah. dichotomy of the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God, and it's completely upside down, mm-hmm. you know, because the wisdom of the world says just what you were saying. Like he was a ripped dude and everybody loved him and they thought he was awesome and this and that. And that, that really was not the case. I mean, yeah, he performed miracles, but most of the time they were just trying to look what they could get from him. It wasn't really because mm-hmm. they thought he was awesome. <laughs> you know. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, but then when you look at the way that God looks, like the Bible says, he, he uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And man, you look at most of the guys in the Bible that God used, they were all 
oh, some yeah. of the most weak people you ever met in your life. <laughs> you know? Oh yeah. And that's one of the things that, you know, I try to get into in this book is the good gift of weakness is really, it begins there in creation, but it walks through creation, fall, the promise, a lot of chapters on Israel, then, you know, several in the life of Jesus and into the church. But it's going from Genesis to Revelation and showing that every point in the storyline of redemption, God is working through the weakness of his people, which culminates, of course, in Jesus Christ. But just read the story of Israel. And at every point you'd go, okay, this is the place of human strength. And God goes, yeah, and we're going to go down the other path. And the Bible, as it unfolds, is very clear that our weakness is the means through which God is displaying his glory and doing us good. Amen. So for somebody to read your book and to begin to have what I believe to be a more biblical understanding and view of weakness. And you've already shared who Christ was. And you can share even more after I ask this question about Jesus' life and ministry and how he really was the epitome of being an example of what it is to live in weakness, but yet without sin. But I think about like myself and I think about like all of my flaws, my personality flaws, my trauma I've been through in my past that affects me in my weakness. I think of my personality weaknesses being a little bit more melancholy at times than some other people, maybe being a little bit more up and down. And you, you know, you got somebody else over here, they're a little bit more even keel. That's looked at as a strength. My kind of emotional roller coaster way of thinking and my anxiety is looked at as weakness, you know. And so we have all kinds of people that we're talking to right now that are thinking to themselves, yeah, but I got this and I got that. And, you know, how can this right perspective of God's perspective on weakness help give them hope and encouragement? And then also, how is understanding that going to help us to change the stigma of weakness within the church and in the world? Mm. So I I think, you know, when you mentioned that, whether it's mental health or physical aspects of us, you know, I'm a person who has had significant struggles with depression and anxiety. I can be a roller coaster of emotions. I'm so enthralled with the gospel. I think, why would I ever be depressed again? And the next day, you know, I'm, I can be despairing of life itself. And I feel, uh, (laughs) yeah. And really there, my thinking that, oh, you just need to be stronger, Eric. If you just had stronger faith and you prayed more and read the Bible more, then all that would be fixed. And what really helped me was going, yeah, I'm too weak to fix this and I need help going to see a therapist and a psychiatrist and these means of common grace that God gave us. Instead of just thinking I need to be a spiritual powerhouse, maybe I can depend on the resources God's given us even in the world. But all that, you know, I think of the Apostle Paul when he's talking about this thorn in his side. And praise God, you know, the wisdom of Paul and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that he didn't define that for us. You know, people debate what it was. You know, there might be some evidence he had some kind of eye issue, you know, from the letter to the Galatians that they would have gouged out their eyes and given to him and he writes with a large hand. Maybe at his conversion with the scales on his eyes, something, you know, happened. I've heard people say it was an ex-wife who left him after his conversion. It could be his struggling with the things I want to do, I don't do and those yeah. things, but it's undefined and that's good because it has application then to all of our scenarios and Amen. he's pleading He's pleading with the Lord. He says three times, you know, he's fasting and he's praying. And he's the fact that he numbers it three times makes us think this is significant. When people say you just need to pray more, I'm picturing Paul, like, you know, the veins are bulging on his forehead, (laughs) pleading with God, like, take this away. And so that flies in the face of these people who say, oh, you just had more faith and repentance, you know. And the answer he gets is my strength is sufficient for you because my power is made perfect in weakness. Mm. And so God doesn't always take away our physical defects and our mental defects and the circumstances that just keep pushing us down. Yeah. What he says is, I'm going to give you myself and my strength will be sufficient in your weakness And Paul's an example that God's strength being sufficient in our weakness doesn't mean, well, it implies the weakness doesn't go away. 
Yeah. Because if the weakness went away, then his strength wouldn't be sufficient in the weakness because the weakness wouldn't be there anymore. And the application to the stigma that we face in the church is, well, what is Paul actually doing right there in 2 Corinthians when he's saying those things? He is addressing the stigma because he is pushing back on the Corinthian church who's saying, you are a weak figure, Paul, because you're not like the super apostles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> who have these dramatic displays of power. And so Paul says, okay, I'll give you a list. They have lists. I'll give you a list. I was stoned this many times, beaten with rods this many times. He's not bragging there about how awesome he was as an apostle who can endure these things. He's saying, here's a list of things that you think are shameful for an apostle to experience. Yeah, And I'm going to actually brag all the more about them because you think they're shameful. <laughs> and Oh, and man, and even awesome. like asking for help. So there's a cultural context thing there where they're saying, Paul, the fact that you don't have patrons who pay your bills and the fact that you're not depending upon people who follow you around and give you a lot of money, you're making tents. That looks weak because the fact that you don't charge for your ministry like influencers say today, like, oh man, you've got to charge for the stuff, your ministry, because if you just give it away for free, what's that say about the value of it? That's what they were saying to Paul. And he's like, yeah. And so in this context, I'm going to make tents and I'm not going to let people pay me because otherwise your trust would rest in the prominence of my patrons. I think a lot of people look at ministry too, and maybe even these apostles would have thrown shade at Paul on this too, but thinking that there's no confidence in your ministry because of the fact that people aren't contributing to it. You know, I could see, I mean, I'm doing a podcast ministry on the side just because I love people and I've experienced brokenness and I want to help people. I don't expect people to donate to me. I ask if they want to go ahead and Mm -hmm. do it, but that's not what I'm doing this for. But then somebody might look at what I'm doing and be like, well, it doesn't have much value because people aren't just giving money to you. And it's like, I don't care. What struck me as I was studying those chapters, especially in second Corinthians was that Paul was strategic there. You know, we know from other letters that he says you need to give to help the saints. And he says, says the laborer is worthy of his wages, quoting Jesus, like the pastor deserves to be paid by those that he serves. Paul's saying in this context, they think it looks weak to work and provide your own salary and not be supported by those you serve. And so I'm intentionally going to do that. Yeah. Because if I give in to what you consider to be strength and what you consider to make my message trustworthy, then you'll trust in that and not in Christ. Yeah. And so I'm going to brag about my weaknesses, and I'm going to put them front and center so that the only thing left to trust in is Jesus and not me. That was a missional strategy for him, and it's something that we really need to grapple with in our own contexts. What does the church and what does the world want us to be and look like in order to listen to us? And what happens if we embrace and become all those things, and then they accept our message because they're trusting in those things? and not Christ. Well, Paul actually says, then the gospel is made void. It's emptied of its power because it's not the gospel anymore, because you're actually trusting in the appearance of strength, not in Jesus. Yeah. That's a huge challenge. Yeah. I think about what we're talking about here. And I, I think about just like being in church on a Sunday morning and you see somebody that comes in that maybe looks a little bit different than you, or maybe doesn't have as much money as you and doesn't dress as well as you or, and man, dude, like I've been in so many churches in my life where people just kind of like snub them. Kind of the same thing that James was talking about that they were doing in the church, you know? I mean, tale as old as time, but some of the most people of humble means have been some of the most, to some degree, weakness. Here's a good example. Mm-hmm. Rich Mullins. You know the story mm-hmm. of Rich Mullins, right? Mm-hmm. Think about mm-hmm. all the weakness that guy went through, and then think of the ministry that he did in his music yeah. that just ministered the gospel to people. I mean, yeah. but most people in the church would point at a guy like that and be like, oh, well, he was, they would have had a problem with a guy like him, like on a personal yep. level. And it's yep. like, man, dude, he was just, a, I like to call myself a struggler. <laughs> that's mm-hmm. That's what I am. I am a struggler. And I am struggling along in my weakness, whether it be the natural weakness or the moral weakness that I sometimes struggle with or whatever. I am a struggler, but that's not where my hope lies. My hope lies in Christ who did it all for me. 
Yeah. So. Yeah. I think that's exactly what Paul is getting at. And, you know, I actually mentioned Paul in the acknowledgments of the book, thanking him, yeah. <laughs> even though he's dead, because I was so struck by Paul's weakness. We tend to think of characters in the Bible, and especially people like Paul, as these glorious, heroic figures. Oh, yeah, the Hall of and, Faith in Hebrews, how they go on about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and then you actually we, look at the lives of all those guys in Scripture, yes. and it's like, uh, wait a minute here. <laughs> I think I think we sometimes turn Paul's words into sort of hyperbole when they shouldn't be. Like him yeah. saying, I preached in weakness and fear and much trembling. And we've all heard guys stand up on stage like, yeah, I'm here in weakness and fear and trembling, but they're not. No. <laughs> they're not trembling. They're not afraid. They've done it 10 billion times. And they're presenting this strong posture as they do it. And I just stopped to think, okay, what if Paul's telling the truth? He actually was afraid. Right. And he was shaking mm. as he preached the gospel. Because, you know, the only physical description we have of Paul in history, which is outside the Bible. So, you know, we take it for what it is, but why would they be lying? The scripture, and I don't have it in front of me, is is of this guy who's, I think it says he has like bowed legs and a pot belly and a hooked nose and little wisps of hair on his head. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was in good strength, probably because he walked a lot. But we're talking about a guy who's been beaten with rods and stoned, 39 lashes, you know. Well, if I went through all of that already... I think I'd be yeah. weak and trembling if I was preaching the gospel too, waiting for it to happen again. Without modern medicine. Yeah. So his bones aren't set right, and his back is a mass of scar tissue, which was probably infected several times before it's healed. And the only thing that's positive in the description we have is like his countenance, yeah, which was full of grace and joy. And so he's not a physically, he doesn't strike awe physically. Yeah. He says, I'm not eloquent. I'm trembling. And even the one that got me, Don Carson in his book on 2 Corinthians 10 through 13, blanking on the title now, was really helpful for me as I wrote about Paul there. But, you know, it's that whole list of Paul saying, I'm going to boast about my weaknesses. You know, five times right. I was this and three times I was that. And Carson points out that, like, in the Roman world, figures would write themselves their own eulogies. Right. And, like, Caesar actually, I think it was uh, Caesar Augustus who wrote, like, five times I conquered these cities and three times I did this. <laughs> And that Paul's taking that form of a brag sheet and yeah. saying, here's the many different ways that I was rejected and mistreated and people didn't want me. Oh, and man. then, but then he tops it off. And, and this is what Carson pointed out that I'd never thought about before. He says, you know, he gets to the end of the list and Paul says, I'm being a fool. I'm talking like a fool, but I'm going to go on. And then he says, like, in what I'm about to say before God, I'm not lying. Carson points out what he's about to share is so utterly shameful that he has to swear an oath because no one would believe it's actually true yeah. of an apostle. And then he shares the experience in Damascus where he was the governor, you know, the authorities wanted to kill him. And so he's let down out of a window in the city wall in a basket yeah. to escape. We think, of, and Carson points out, we picture this in Acts as this heroic, daring escape that looks good on a flannel graph in Sunday school. <laughs> but Paul is presenting it as something he is deeply ashamed of. And in Rome, the highest military honor was the Corona Muralis, the wall crown given to the soldier who was the first one to go over the wall when they invaded a city. And Paul is saying, I was the first one down the wall to get out of the city. And I think, what pastor's conference do you go to where they have a panel discussion of these pastors that you're supposed to be like? And one of them goes, hey, guys, I ran away, and it doesn't make me any less of an apostle than you. Yeah, I was just thinking when you were saying that, I was imagining exactly what you just said. I was thinking, can you imagine, like you said, a panel of pastors and, and one of these guys gets up and says, I've had five hospitalizations for mental health and I take two different antidepressants <laughs> and I've been divorced once. But you know yeah. what I'm saying? I, I mean, yeah. can you imagine? But because I mean, when, in a sense, that's what Paul was doing. And so when I ate and drank and breathed for so many decades. And this is gets back to your question, where is this book coming from? These kind of pastor's conferences. Yeah. 
where we were given these heroes who were pictures of strength and endurance and perseverance. I've never heard about them. The, the faithfulness of, of years of ministry. And there's nothing yes. wrong with saying that. No. But at the same time, I hear what you're saying, man. Because like I never, people will go on and on and on about how faithful so and so was for fifty years or whatever. Yes. But you never hear anything about any of their weakness. Yes. I never heard about a guy like me who was literally face down in the carpet of his office on a Saturday night into the wee hours of Sunday morning, bawling his eyes out with snot running down his face, pleading for God to send someone else to preach Mm. until blood was coming out of my nose because I've been on my face so long because I couldn't do it and I didn't want to do it. Yeah. And then when you feel like that, you're like, I guess I need to quit. And I eventually did. But, you know, I know, Ligon Duncan at one of the Together for the Gospel conferences gave this message on the life of, I think it was Elijah, where he talks about, and Duncan talks about his own weakness mm-hmm. and his own years of depression and despair. I had a friend that actually went to that conference, a pastor, who was planning to kill himself when he got home. He had it planned out because he was at the end of himself. And he was going to the conference as sort of a last-ditch effort. Is there any hope? And he heard this talk from Ligon Duncan about all of his own weaknesses and God being his strength in that. And it saved his life, literally. Like, he's still alive and pastoring. And I just think we need more men and women like that who are willing to say, I'm utterly weak, and Christ is all I have. Amen. Man, that is the good gift of weakness, brothers and sisters Mm -hmm. in Christ. I mean, what our brother just shared in a nutshell, that is the good gift of weakness. That is what God offers us. That is what he offers us in Christ. It is okay for you to be weak. It is okay for you to struggle and to be a struggler. You are in good company with Paul, with Peter, with John, and even with Jesus. I Mm -hmm. mean, man, brothers and sisters in Christ, this has been a great word of encouragement for me. And I know when this book comes out and when is the release date for the good gift of weakness? June 4th. June 4th. So coming out the first week of June, brothers and sisters in Christ, I I encourage you highly to get this book and to read it and to be encouraged with the hope that is found in Christ and to realize that weakness is a good gift. It is a good gift. There are forms of weakness that are hard to deal with, but even the hardship of the hard things that we face with our weaknesses, and I'm not being cliche when I say this, you all know that, but Romans 8, 28 is still true. He works all those things together for good to those who love him Mm -hmm. and who are called according to his purpose. He is using even those moral failures and weaknesses and flaws that you have in your personality or whatever it is. All of those things are working together for good and for Mm. God's glory. And, you know, man, dude, like when you really look at Jesus and you look at God, you look at what the Bible actually says and how God works with his people, it's all us messed up, jacked up people that God is using to further his kingdom more so than the Pharisees. Really, the only thing the Pharisees ever did was just the example of what not to be and what not to do, I think, (laughs) scripturally. You know, so brother, I am super duper excited to get a copy of this book when the Mm. time comes. Is it going to come out on Audible as well? It is. Yep. I'll be recording the audio book version here in March. Oh, man. Praise God. I'm an Audible guy, but I know we got a lot of listeners, too, that are going to want actual copies of it. So June 4th for you folks, the good gift of weakness. And Eric, it has been a pleasure to have you on for two episodes of the Broken Vessels podcast. And you have been such a huge encouragement. And I praise God. You all know Jennifer Moody, who's been on the podcast several times and is actually one of the administrators for the Facebook group and all of that. But she's the one that recommended Eric because of his books, uh, Worthy and uh, Jesus and Gender. And it was kind of fun because we recorded 
the two episodes that we've done together today did that back to back and kind of had a little break in between, but I was able to connect Jennifer with Eric and she was able to share with him just what God did in her and her husband, Brad's lives through him and Elise Fitzpatrick's writings. Mm. It was a blessing just to hear them talk back and forth, man. It was glorious. (laughs) Just all of us to be able to share our weakness together and say, Hey, this is a gift. Praise God for his goodness to us. Right. Mm, amen. 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 Well, brother, I'd like you to go ahead and share again anything you'd like to share before we sign off your website or any other links or anything you'd like to share. Yeah, you can get a hold of me. Find me online and social media platforms at my handle at all those platforms is EM Shoemaker, which is E M S C H U M A C H E R. So spelled Shoemaker, pronounced Shoemaker. Website is emshoemaker.com. And yeah, I just. Thank you, Josh, for what you're doing, and I'm thankful for your audience of people who are grappling with what it means to be broken vessels, and you know, God only saves the weak. Amen. Amen. That's That's who Jesus came for. Yeah. uh, Embrace it and run to him. Amen. Amen. You cannot come to Christ unless you realize that you need him, and the only way that you're going to know that you need him is if you realize you can't do it on your own. It's only him. (laughs) <laughs> Amen. We we have complete inability and we we are weak and he is strong and his strength is made perfect in our weakness. So praise mm-hmm. God for those good words. Well, brothers mm-hmm. and sisters in Christ, it's been another honor and a privilege to talk with you all here on the Broken Vessels podcast and we will see you next week. Mm-hmm.